What up, though, everybody? Thank you for tuning in and watching Knockouts and Three Counts again. But before we get to tonight's special guest, I thought I would give you a little snapshot to what Justin Janes has been doing during quarantine. We told you he made his UFC debut. Well, check out how he ruined poor Frank Camacho's night the other night at UFC Vegas before we jump into the interview. Television champion, aka Shane T, boy, the baddest champion you ever seen, boy. And you're listening to Knockouts and Three Counts. What up, though, everybody? This is Kyle, and you are listening to Knockouts and Three Counts. And as we told you, we've got a very special guest tonight. As you can see, it's not Devin or any of the normal boys with me tonight. They were uh, kind of a little preoccupied. So Devin is going to be replaced by Corey tonight. Corey, throw out your social media real quick before we get to our special guest. Uh, fight fan from 313. The only thing I use is Twitter. So, other than that, what's going on, guys? How's it going tonight? Hey, it's going Can't good. Compl- Can't complain. Well, you know where to find me. You can find me at Detroit Knockout at Detroit N O K O U T. Make sure you're following the show at KO3C Pod, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Well, Without any further ado, we got a guy that I've known for quite a long time. And uh, if you guys have been watching UFC anytime recently, then you probably do too. We've got Justin James. How you doing, brother, man? Hey, man, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me on the show. No problem, man. We were talking about this when we were getting down on uh, that Call of Duty, you know, before all this happened. But uh, now you just uh, made the perfect opportunity for it to happen. So throw out your social media and let everybody know where they can find you if they're not already doing so. First things first, I don't really want to talk about that Warzone tournament. I'm kind of butthurt about that. <laughs> uh, if you want to talk about uh, social media, we can go to Instagram, J-A-Y-0-9-M-I on Instagram. Uh, on Twitter, it's Justin Janes MMA. And on Facebook, it's just Justin Janes, man. So I appreciate your follows, and uh, thanks for thanks for looking up. Sorry, these mosquitoes are eating the fuck up. There's no mosquitoes in Las Vegas, but God damn, there's some mosquitoes in Michigan. So let's oh, yeah. talk about let's talk about that, dude. So you uh you know you're originally from here, but you're out training in um Vegas now at a Oh. I lost you, Kyle. Yeah, I think we lost him. Oh uh, no. Oh, you didn't lose me. I'm good. I'm in here. He's back. He's ready to go. <laughs> nope, I'm in here. My bad. I was in here. I didn't realize it went out. <laughs> but yeah, I was just saying, man, like you, uh, you know, you're originally from here, but you know, you're out there training in Vegas at Extreme Couture, man. You didn't pick a very good time to get away from the heat. Yeah, man. I, I've been on Extreme Couture. I did a college internship uh, at Extreme Couture 2010, 2011. Graduated college Uh-oh. in 2000. Now he's breaking up. He takes it. Ah, uh, fuck. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, yeah, I went out in 2009 with Darren Crookshank for the first time, and then I did my college internship in 2010, 2011. As soon as I graduated college, I went out there, and I've been working there full-time ever since. So tell me a little bit about that. You know, um, when I originally met you, man, I was 16 years old. We were training at Mass Gym, man. Yep. Uh, back then, man, you had like a who's who, a killer's role of uh, – you know, people as far as Michigan goes, you had Miles Jury, who's in Bellator, yep. was in UFC. You were there. James was still fighting in UFC. James, Lee, for those who don't know who I'm talking about, um, you know, you Eric, Moon, the- Eric, yeah, Moon, Eric Moon, Ed Moon, Lagman, Jorge. John Tolth is a grappling coach. Yep. Kara Rowe is a boxing coach. Dave Lester. I mean, the list goes on. and I was I was blessed, I guess, uh, you know, early on to be blessed with these these great uh, teammates, these great coaches. I still work with Kara. I still work with James to this day. It's been a couple of years since I worked with Tolf, but we're talking about a, a world class grappling coach. And like I said, Kara Kara Rose, seventeen oh world champion from Canada. I mean, I, I couldn't have a better team behind me before I moved to Vegas. So I, I'm very fortunate for that. So tell me about that. What went into your move into going into Vegas, man? Like, you know, you were from here, you know, what made you make that move to move from here to go train out at Extreme Couture and like why Extreme Couture? Uh, Well, like I said, I went out there with Darren uh, a couple of years back and I meshed with some of the guys really well. Uh, You know, Ryan Couture and I, uh, 
you know, developed a, a good, really, really strong friendship, you know, and uh, a couple of the guys on the team, Martin Campman and I were super close. He ended up coming to Michigan and cornering me a couple of times, uh, you know, throughout my early in my pro career, you know, these, I just felt these guys cared about me. And it's not that the guys in Michigan didn't care about me. Our coaches didn't care about me, but driving an hour to an hour and a half to each training session one way was just taxing and exhausting. Not to mention in order to pay for training, I was having to work, you know, a, a job during the day, then drive an hour, hour and a half to training, hour and a hour and a half back. At, at Vegas, Extreme Couture, you know, I get to go there in the morning. Uh, I get to get my morning session in. I get to work during the day. I get to get my evening session in. And I get to go home. I, I live one mile from the gym. It's a three-minute to a five-minute drive. I mean, convenience and, uh, you know, financially, that it was a smart move for me to do at the time. And uh, like I said, I still work at the gym, still run the kids program. Uh, but that, that's essentially why I moved, you know, just for the convenience of working there and training there. So Corey, I know you've got a bunch of questions, man. We were talking before we got here. So here you go. Here's that. Fire them. Fire them. Fire them. <laughs> well, slightly new to the show, so I might not be as good with asking and wording the questions as, uh, hey, no worries, fan, dude. But, Fire um, them. I'll answer them best I can. But, but, uh, what my big question was with, uh, necessarily you moving to Vegas was it was, I was newer to your career. I got to see your, you know, upcoming rise with the first fight in the UFC. Like I'm sure a lot of new fans did. And um, I, my question was when I was doing the research is you were training out in Vegas, but you were still fighting over here in WXC. Sure. How, how was that working out? Uh, you know, I just have a good fan base and, you know, these local promoters, they need to sell tickets, man. And, you know, having my, uh, I have a strong fan base in Michigan. I mean, keep this in mind. Like I fought in California, I fought in Scotland, the UK, I fought in India, I fought in Las Vegas, like, but out of all the places I fought, you know, I feel my biggest fan base is in Michigan. So coming back to the WXC, I was a WXC 145 pound champ, WXC 155 pound champ, uh, TWC 155 pound champ. I fought for Big John's MMA. I love going back to Michigan and uh, mostly because it's a free vacation. I get to go out, fly out Thursday, fight on Saturday. And then, you know, I got not that I wasn't making a lot of money, but I make a couple grand in my fights. And then right. stay in Michigan for a week, see family, see, see my son. Yeah. So, you know, when it came down to that, it was, it was a smart financial decision. I basically get a week off work and I get paid to do it. So. Yeah, that's... absolutely. No, yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. That's, and that's when we were kind of having our little pre-show talk, that's kind of what I was assuming is, you know, being a hometown boy, it was nice to be able to, you know, travel back and get paid for it. Yeah. You know? And it's not like, I mean, I fought for the WXC, you know, three times in like two years, TWC three times in the last six years. It wasn't like I was trying to fight for him every weekend, but like I said, you know, once or twice a year, come back, get a payday, get a week off work. So, you know, after I get, after I fight, I can, I can go home and if you know, if it was in the fall, I could go deer hunting. If it was in the spring, do some turkey hunting, spend time with family, spend time with my son. And that was the most important part to me. Yeah, absolutely. It makes, and that makes perfect sense too. I mean, like you said, being able to just head back home, it's, it's, it's a nice change of pace once in a while. Yeah, absolutely. No question. So My other brought up question was um, coming into the UFC, how big, of a, how big of a boost did you feel on the social medias with such an impressive performance? I mean, to, to not only step in on short notice, and, but to do it in the fashion that you did, it, you, really, uh, you really impressed, I'm sure, a lot of people. I know you, 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 you know, you brought me on board. That's the damn yeah. I, I appreciate that, man. And you know, the last couple of years, I'm just going to keep it simple. Last couple of years, you know, fighting on these smaller shows, WXC, TWC, Big John's, California promotion I fought for, you can't lose at these smaller promotions, man. And, you know, my, my goal from the beginning of moving to Vegas was to get to the UFC. I, I, you know, I don't know if I want to be the UFC champion. You know what? How about you, how about, you know, you turn pro first, how about you train first? How about you fight first? And then see what you can do. And, you know, I've been doing this for so long as my goal this the last 10, 13 years has been to get to the UFC. And now that I'm here and it was the first time I'm in the back with my coach, Dennis, who I've been in there as since an amateur, you know, since 2009. And I'm like, Dennis, man, I have no pressure right now. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to throw these hands. And if I gas out, I gas out. You know, if I have no interest in wrestling. I have no interest in grappling. I just want to have a highlight real fight. The night before the fight, Dana White said, he said all the fighters in a room, he's like, hey, somebody tomorrow can change their life. Somebody's getting a $50,000 bonus, and that's life-changing for anybody. You know, no matter how much money you make, 50 grand in one night is, not, is, is it just insane. So yeah. when he said that, I was like, all right, what can I do to get that fucking money? And taking somebody down and, and laying on them for three minutes, which I could do, 
yeah. I have no interest in that. I want to knock somebody out. I want people buzzing about my fight like they have been for the last week. Mm-hmm. So let, let's talk a little bit about that, man. Like, you know, you talked about fighting for promotions like WXC and things of that nature, man. Like, Tell everybody a little bit about like what that journey is like fighting through those regional shows, because it's not like you were fighting bums. I mean, you had quite the rivalry going with Johnny Bedford, who was in the UFC. You know, I mean, WXC's brought guys in from American Top Team. I've seen them come in from Jackson's. I've seen them come in from all over the place, especially now that they've got the deal that's on a UFC Fight Pass. So for those who don't know, can you, you know, describe, talk a little bit about like what that grind is like coming up through that regional scene. And like, for those who don't know the quality of competition that you're getting for the guys who maybe are right on that line of getting back to the UFC. And, and that's the thing for the WXC, the WXC promotes such tough fighters. I mean, Jason Fisher, Darren Crookshank, these are, you know, uh, Daquan Townsend, Cody Stamen. All these guys have fought for the, for the WXC. Cody's ranked like top 10 in the world right now. And he's fought for WXC, you know, a, a top 10 in the world. That is, you know, uh, a, a chaos Williams who, you know, just had another higher real finish a couple months ago. Like the WXC isn't pulling these pulling bum fighters. Like every time I fought my last fight was against James Warfield. He had like 25 wins with like 20 knockouts. I did. Did I feel I was more skilled than him? Absolutely. But you know, stepping in this in this regional promotion, he still has a puncher's chance. And if he lands one on my chin, not only is the night over, my career is over. You can't, like I said before, you can't lose at these small regional promotions. Expect to get the big stage. So I was super stressed out about always fighting. You know, especially after ten wins. You know, fighting these smaller promotions because I always knew, like, hey, if I lose here, I'm never getting to the big show. I'm never going to accomplish my dreams. And you know, I waited out long enough. I had enough wins. You know, these smaller promotions that it all paid off. God damn those mosquitoes! <laughs> <laughs> I got a question about that too. Do sure, you, go ahead. Now, uh, do you think being in Vegas, being so close to where they were holding the event, and the fact that you did shit step in on short notice, do you think uh, that kind of helped get your foot in the UFC, or did you already kind of have the ball rolling towards where your next fight was going to be? You know, it, it oh, it just depends who you ask, man. Like these last couple of weeks have been so tough for me. Like I never thought I was going to get in the UFC. Like I see all, all my past rivals. I see, you know, up and comers, you know, getting their shot. I'm just over and over, just not getting my shot, not getting my shot. So I can't say the last couple of weeks haven't been frustrating because again, I never thought I was going to get my chance, but you know what? I have a great management team, Iridium sports. I have Jason house as my manager guy goes to bat for me. He shows up, you know, when he's supposed to, and he, and he gets the job done. Not to mention my coaching staff. I got Dennis Davis as my head coach. He's been since 2009. Roman Isabel, who I've been working with for the last two or three years. Uh, Andrew Jake, uh, Jacoby, who's been my strength conditioning coach for the last three years. These guys are making sure that I'm in shape, ready to go. And, uh, you know, my weight's low. And, and that's what it needs. You know, it takes a village to, to, to create this. What? Oh, no. I leave me alone. So let me ask you about that, man. Like, you know, what? can you take me into a little bit of – what that call was like for you were you already in talks with them like kind of like on a wait you know like on a wait and be ready thing with the ufc or what did that look like with your opponent's uh, opponent dropping out and then you just you step into this fight you know on two three days notice and like you said you were ready to go but was it something where you kind of already had any idea that that was coming at all so i was working with a very prestigious very uh very respected manager uh you know last year and uh on may 31st when i beat james warfield he's like hey man you're in the ufc you're in the ufc you know we're just waiting and then we just kept we just kept waiting we just kept waiting and then you know i I got faced with some financial situations and uh you know i ended up switching management company and like i said uh you know not talking bad about anybody of course uh you know i just happened to you know there's a lucky spot i was in vegas and uh you know, I, I, I don't know, man, like getting the call was just surreal. I remember I was with my girlfriend or, or driving out to get in for, to get dinner. Uh, Jason calls me and just said, all right, Hey, how's your weight? And I was like, Hey, I'm at 170. He's like, can you make weight this weekend? I said, yes. And he goes, all right, you're Frank, you're fighting Frank Camacho on Saturday. And I didn't jump in the air or anything. I was, I remember it very well. I was driving down Las Vegas Boulevard and I just said, okay. And uh, hung up the phone. And my girlfriend's like, oh, well, who's that? I was like, oh, it's Jason. She's like, oh, what do you want? I said, I guess I'm fighting Saturday. And, you know, she lost it. And I called my mom. She was, you know, super excited. I called my dad. He was super excited. Um, I mean, honestly, it's still setting in on me. Like, I, I uh, 
And man, you know, Kyle, I'm just gonna say I was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> I'm not any special, more special than anybody else. I'm just a tough, gritty Midwestern guy trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit, man. And uh, I just got, I was in the right spot at the right time, man. I got lucky. That's but, literally what I just told you in the text when we were talking earlier, man. Like you say it's lucky, but I mean, like I said, I've known you for quite a long time now. So, I mean, I've seen you've been fighting for years and years and years. I've been to fights from Eastern Michigan to when we were going to the fights at the Royal Oak Music Theater and shit. Hell yeah. So it's definitely not, it's definitely yeah. not luck, man. That's hard work, you know, create an opportunity. That's, but we're that's, going far, that's far from luck, man. Uh, the, <laughs> way, the way that you stepped in under the, under the lights, the first UFC fight, the fact that you barely, you, you, if you were nervous, you didn't, you didn't show it outward whatsoever. Um, the fact that you just stepped in there and just completely dominated it, you know, at this point, a UFC veteran, you know, of multiple UFC vet and just, it was impressive, man. It, it, it truly was impressive, bro. I, I really appreciate that, man. But you know, luck to me is if you, if you continue to put yourself in the right spot, at the right time, eventually something's going to give, you know what I mean? Like I've been in Vegas for over 10 years. I'm 15 and four. I've been on a five foot win streak this past. I was on a four fight win streak. I keep putting myself in these situations, you know, it, but it does require luck. Like there's a lot of guys that are getting in that, you know, maybe have done a little bit less, you know, or maybe they got a little luckier, but again, you know, I, I've had a lot of people, Oh, you got lucky with the punch. It's like I knew my game plan. Um, I knew Frank was going to want to brawl as well, or I assumed he was going to want to brawl as well. And he drops his right hand. And, you know, I just, again, I had to, I had a lucky game. I, I don't know. Luck is the only way I can describe it. You know, it's <laughs> a, it's luck is the only way I can, that I can enjoy to describe it. Because like I said, I'm, you know, my coaching staff said this was going to happen. They said that left hook was going to land. And when I landed the first time, I was like, Oh shit, it fucking landed. No way. Like this is seven fight <laughs> UFC bet. I mean, obviously it wasn't my whole thought process, but I just remember thinking like, Oh shit, that one landed. Hey, let's do that again. Bing. Right. He fell the second time, and that's the beginning of the end. All right. So let me ask you about that, though. So going into that, obviously, these are different circumstances than anybody's used to with the pandemic and all that. Did that change anything for you, like, leading into the fight? Like, even though it was a short-notice fight, like, did that change anything for you, like, in the experience going up to it with, like, the different COVID testing, or did that change anything for you fight day? Honestly, no. I, you know – it just was so overwhelming and so much to take in, in in those two days. Like that's the only way I can really describe it is overwhelming. Like still, I, I mean, I understand it happened. I understand what happened, but looking back and it's just like, like, man, I, I, I almost wish I could have got to enjoy the experience, enjoy the lead up. There was no lead up. It was, do you want to fight this guy? I said, yes. All right. Next day I'm weighing in to fight and he missed his weight. I make weight on, I can't believe I made weight. It was fucking incredible, but you know, I do, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, sorry, someone, someone keeps calling me. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I, I show up, I make weight. And next thing I know I'm fighting this seven time UFC veteran. He hasn't had two fights in the UFC. He has seven. And if you count this last one, he's been a part of four fight of the night bonuses. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like this guy's a savage. He's a heavy handed fan favorite, man. Like it yeah. couldn't win any better for me, man. And, I, and like I said, I go back to how I feel. I just feel so lucky and, and, and happy to be in the situation I'm in today. So not to not to pick any weird spots or anything. I mean, it's no secret that your opponent missed weight. First of all, what did that do for you? And secondly, just because I've always wanted to know, because I've had multiple guys, I know that this has happened. Do they split that where you guys like you get 20% of his money or like, how does that work when somebody misses weight? And is it something that bothers you that much before you get in the cage? The only thing that bothered me, honestly, Kyle, was I was worried the fight was going to get called off because you have to understand Frank is a big, strong dude. Like he it's not like he's fat. He has he is less fat than I do. You know what I mean? Like he's very defined. He's very lean. He's in shape. When I heard that he was heavy, you know, my manager hit me up an hour prior and told me that he was going to miss weight. I'm like, that's fine. Just stay wherever you're at. and Let's weigh in. Let's just call it done. I got 20 percent of the purse. I haven't gotten it yet, but, you know, I got 20 percent of the purse. I don't care about that. I was so worried that the fight was going to be canceled because how many times is a guy cutting weight? He can't make it. And he has to go to the hospital and get an IV. And that's all I could really think about was, man, I, I told him, Frank, if I could stop cutting weight, hydrate up. Like I don't, 
two pounds isn't going to make or break the fight. Two pounds is nothing to me. I don't give a fuck about that. I don't care. I've missed weight. It happens. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a gnarly sport. He's been traveling. We have this COVID thing going on. I don't give an F about him missing weight. I'm just happy that, you know, he was healthy enough to compete the next day. And that was my only concern, the fight getting canceled. If uh, he went to the hospital for an IV. Yeah, or you, I mean, you, you hear about those uh, situations, probably one or two fights a month where, you know, somebody's got to pull out. I mean, look at the, the, what's his, uh, Carl Robinson versus uh, Marvin Vittori. That fight got canceled and postponed, what, three times? Carl Roberson's a hoe after talking all that shit that just made twice like, like that. He's a hoe, dude. Oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know the situation exactly, but if he's talking shit and he missed weight twice, yeah, you're kind of a hoe. Yeah. Corey, am I right or wrong? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know the guy. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't he can't even deny you. shit I just said. <laughs> the way you pause tells everything I needed to say, so you already said it for me. Well, yeah, you can't miss weight and then talk shit. That that fucking suck. So let me ask you about this. So I've known you for quite a long time, but uh, since when did you decide that uh, all of a sudden you were going to be the guitar hero again? So that was even. And where the you. fuck did that come from? Dude, so yeah, it was crazy. I was in college, and you know. It's- 10 or 15, 12 years ago, you know, like we, we guitar here was a thing in 2010. Like everybody's playing it. I was addicted to it. I, I would skip class to go play this stupid fucking game. And, uh, you know, on the weekends I get drunk and I'd be jamming out of my guitar on top of the fucking, you know, the, the tea or on, on the coffee stand or whatever. And then I remember Corey Michaelitis, my college roommates like, Oh, I bet you won't walk out to the cage, you know, doing this shit. And I was like, fucking bet. And once I say bet, it's a wrap. Like uh, I'm going to do it. So next day we planned, like I got aviator sunglasses. I got this headband that said like, turn them up or don't be a bitch or something like that. And uh, if you guys look at my Instagram, like the last picture I posted from like 2010, God damn, like a throwback Thursday kind of deal has me, you know, strumming a guitar like so walking down the cage to ACDC uh, uh, TNT. And uh, I did that like once at Royal Oak and I did it once in Vegas and sure dog put it on their website. I've emailed them at least two or three times to take it down and uh, they have no interest in taking it down. They don't even respond to me. And uh, it's stuck ever since. Actually, I thought I was going to get away from it once I got to the UFC, but it seems like it's being reborn. Hell, the new fans now don't even know what Guitar Hero is. It's so long ago. Wait a minute. So my thing is, didn't they didn't come to you about that at all? Like, you know, your name, you know, your nickname is this or whatever. And he just already have it on the card for you. They I had it on the card. Always- I always assume the fighters got to like write out, you know, what they wanted to be called and how they wanted to be, you know, announced the Bruce buffer treatment, you know? Yeah. And, and I thought that too, that, you know, on your, on the, on the forms for the contract, they, uh, they'd ask like, Hey, what do you want to be called? And then they, then they'd have us record. How do you want your name said? And then you say it twice. You say, you say the first time you say it enunciate like Justin James and the second time Justin James. Oh, and some of, the, with some of the weird names out there, I'm sure they need that. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't have a weird name. My name is Justin. No, you're, yours is simple <laughs> enough. So, anyways, Bruce, after uh, after the fight, he's like, "Do you really want to be, you know, called the Guitar Hero?" I said, "No, don't call me that." And then, so on the second, when they announced the win, uh, he didn't announce me as the Guitar Hero. But leading up to the fight, or not leading up, but in the cage when he's announcing us both. He did call me the guitar hero. I don't care, man. I might go back to it, but I, I don't know what I'll do. Like, kids these days won't even know what that is, man. So I don't want to look that st- – I mean, I already look stupid enough, but I don't want to look that stupid. <laughs> All right. So clearly, like we said, you know, the conditions to this weren't um, the the greatest of uh, conditions leading up to a fight for you. But uh, tell me a little bit about what you were doing, you know, prior to that with quarantine. You know, were you able to train the same? You know, like what have you been doing in the – uh you know, in the time where we've all been sitting around, you know, other than uh, playing a little bit of Call of Duty Warzone. A little Warzone uh, action. You know, I, I've been I'm catching these affordable. dubs over here, bro. Hey, we, hey, we got to talk <laughs> about that. I, I know you didn't win my tournament, so shut your mouth. Hey, um, I put you out, though. You did, you fucking <laughs> asshole. And I, and I didn't get killed. I crashed the helicopter into the Took hospital. Him. That was so fucking terrible. Took him out um, of his tournament. Up, be, be, besides Warzone, honestly, the gym got opened up a couple weeks ago. I've been training with some of the best guys. You know, uh, I was training. I did a couple sessions with Evan Dunham, uh, Neo or, or, or Noad, uh, Noan Lahat, uh, you know, uh, Israeli fighter. is ranked like the best Israeli fighter, UFC vet. Uh, you know, Bellator. He's currently a Bellator fighter right now. Like, I've been training with some of these guys for the last couple weeks. 
when this call happened, it wasn't like they called me off the couch. I was, I, not only was I in shape, my weight was low and I was ready for this fight. Like I, I looked at the odds, like they had me at a plus that I saw it at plus three twenty on some sites. And the, again, the, these odds makers are thinking that I'm coming in out of shape, rolling off the couch. I was in shape. I was ready to go. I've been training the last five weeks. Like I said, I, I look to jump right back in at the end of August or September to get this cut healed and uh, I'll be ready to go, man. Like I said, I was in shape. Michael Bisbing said like, Oh, he came in blitzing. Cause he doesn't have a gas tank. I had a gas tank for three rounds. I just happened to clip him. And uh, you know, when I smell blood, I, I finish on it. So that, that, and that's all that happened. So does that give you any type of uh, extra fuel? Like with the fact that people aren't, you know, as versed on what you've done, you know, leading up to the UFC, even though you've got social media where anybody can find anything they need to know. Like, does that give you any more fuel as you go into the cage where, like you said, you know, Michael Bisbing and all the rest of them are thinking you're some guy just rolling off the couch. Little do they know, you know, you've had what, 87 fights all together. Like when you're, I've had, when, I've had so many fights, man. I had like 47 amateur fights. I have 20 pro fights now. Like, as you know, like Michigan back in the day wasn't sanctioned. So you could fight every weekend if you wanted, no matter what you could get knocked out. I know I'm not going to name any names, but I know some people that went like <laughs> two and 30 as their record, like, and they don't give a fuck. They just show up and they fight, you Street know, and fighting specialist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what they would say. I mean, you've been those like, these, this is how I, this is the circuit I grew up on. You know, I feel I'm the last generation of its guys that actually want to see who the best fighter was. I feel it's a lot of guys now like, Oh, they see the counter McGregor's. They want to talk shit, handpick their opponents. When I first started, the reason I got into fighting wasn't to handpick my opponents. I genuinely wanted to see if I was the best guy. I'm not saying I was the best guy, but I wanted to see if I was. And, you know, I, now I've made my mark. Now I'm in the UFC and, you know, like, fuck. Like, all the guys that I was training with and fighting with back then, they're, they're, they're you know, they, they, got their, they got their career now. And I'm just starting mine now at 30 years old. So uh, I couldn't be more happy about that. And, and honestly, that might even work in your advantage because – like I was saying with you showing no nerves in the cage on that first fight, man, I mean, like that, all that experience, you know, just now getting to the UFC, you see it a lot with uh, the UFC signing these young guys. I mean, sometimes it works out, but it seems like more often than not, it doesn't because they're just not ready for the bright lights or they maybe run into a style that they're not necessarily familiar with, but because you've been training with such high level guys for so long, I mean, you kind of, more prepared than the average uh, up and comer, you know, that's, and you know what? There's a lot of tough guys out there, man. There's guys that are better fighters than me that are coming up through the ranks, but you can't trade that, that experience for just because a guy's tough or he has a lot of uh, potential. You just can't trade the experience, man. I've already, I've been in every bad situation as an amateur. I, like I said, I almost had 50 amateur fights. I've been choked out. I've had my joints, you know, I had my shoulder, uh, you know, I, I, I tore my rotator cuff, you know, as an amateur, because, you know, just being in these situations, I've been knocked out of and TKO'd. There hasn't been a bad situation. I haven't been, and I've lost in every way possible as an amateur. Now I'm a pro. I haven't been finished as a pro because I have this experience, you know, a couple of fights ago, I fought this super tough guy that was on Dana White's contender series. His name was Jacob for sales. And, uh, you know, the game plan originally was to stick him and then get away, so hit him, get away. Well, guess what? Jacob had a different plan. That motherfucker got in the pocket and started slugging with me and I wasn't ready for it. And, uh, going in, uh, in the first round, he drops me with a right hand. I fall to my butt. I jump up and he pr starts pressuring me for the finish. Well, being a college wrestler, I faint, you know, a big punch. I shoot in, I shoot a double. Like I realized he was expecting it and I end up pulling guard. Now with that being said, after the fight, I got a lot of criticism. Like, why are you pulling guard? Why are you pulling guard? You need to be on top of this guy. It's like, listen, I just got dropped. I need my head to recover now. I'm going to, you know, I lost this round. When you get dropped in a round, the chance of you coming back and winning that round is slim to none. So my yeah. thought process, there's only a minute and a half left in the round. Let me take the nothing. So uh, anyways, long story short, I shoot a double leg. I pull guard and I, and I subdue his arms and he can't do any more strikes. And we rest for the next minute. Coming out the second round, I fucking put him away. I hit him with a huge uppercut from no man's land. I drop him. He shoots in on me now to recover. And I finish the guillotine. He, he didn't try to pull guard. So again, you know, coming up from a young, God damn, these mosquitoes fucking suck. You know, the, the, the young back, experience. Right? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome Appreciate back. you. Um, but yeah, the, the young experienced guy is going to try to get up, stand toe to toe and try and win that first round again. No, I mean, I mean, being a vet, I, I know in my head, I just got dropped. I cannot win this round. You know, it's a fight to me. It's the best of, of three rounds. Like don't, if you lose the first round, it's, you still have two more rounds, two more chances to come back. And even if you lose the second round, you can still knock them out in the third or seven in the third. So, 
you know, I think the experience is what's going to separate me from the rest. A lot of these guys, a lot of these tough fighters, yeah, they have a great record and they're knocking everybody out, but guess what? They don't have the experience. They don't know what to do when they get put in these situations. I feel I've been in all these situations and I know what to do. And, uh, you know, that's going to, that's going to affect my career in the long term the most. So, so with, with you coming in for in, that fight, um, was it something where they kind of like signed you to a multi-fight thing beforehand, or was this just like a one fight, like, see how you do deal? No, uh, I, you know, honestly, when Jason sent me the contract, I was so excited. I didn't even read the contract. I didn't even know what I was getting paid. They could have, it, it could have said $0. You're fighting for free. And I wouldn't get enough <laughs> because, you know, I was so excited to be in the moment and so excited to achieve all my dreams. Cause at this point in my career, this is all I've ever worked for, man. This is all I've ever cared about is just getting to the UFC. You know, like, oh, I want to be the UFC champ. You know, that comes down the road, man. You can't, you can't be a, a, an ant and expect to build this big ant hill by yourself. You know, oh, I want to, you know, I don't, I don't know. That's a bad analogy, but you know what? Like, I just want to get to the UFC. Now I'm here. I can reevaluate my goals and uh, man, I'm excited to fight again. Like it's been a long time since I've been excited to fight. And Like I said, here I am. And here we go. <laughs> so our show opportunity presents itself right yeah exactly exactly absolutely so our show covers pro wrestling too hell yeah i gotta know i know you like pro wrestling to some degree are you i don't i don't like pro wrestling i love pro wrestling all right let's get into it then what was it that got you into it and who's your all-time favorite stone cold steve austin is my all-time favorite he's by far the best superstar you mean that guy what's that say again i said you mean that guy Dude, Steve, like, like I, I meet a lot of famous fighters. You know, I've worked for Randy Couture for the last 10 years. And, like, who would really star strike you? And I can really only think of two people. I'm not just saying it from a martial arts background, but Steve Austin and, or uh, um, uh, Chuck Norris. Like, those are the only two people I could think that I could be like, oh, my God, I'm fully, totally starstruck by. But Steve Austin being the number one. You know, the re- like, a lot of the reasons I even got into wrestling because of Steve Austin. And when I first started folk style wrestling and like 10 years old was because I thought that I could wear a knee brace and spandex and come out and body slam <laughs> people. And, uh, you know, unfortunately it didn't turn out. That was it. But Steve Austin has been like my mentor. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. Like uh, Steve Austin is by far my favorite athlete of all time. And if I had to say I'm in, I'm where I'm at right now because of my, cause I wanted to be him as a young age, obviously it changed and progressed and evolved you know, with the years to come, but I got into the field I'm in because of Stone Cold Steve Austin or William for that matter. Hey, hey, so first of all, great fucking pick because he's my all-time favorite. Oh, no way, really? No shit. Well, so I was trying to point back there because that was the picture from when I met him a couple years ago when I was in New Orleans for Mania. Um, So just so that it doesn't burst your bubble, if you ever do get to meet the guy, He's cool as shit. Like literally when I met him, he's like, it's like a fucking family reunion. Sure. Cause I met him like at, like when I was eight at the fucking autorama, you know? So, right, right. Uh, you know, yeah. Austin, Austin, I think did it for all of us. Um, What are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, some of these guys that we keep seeing kind of bounce back and forth between MMA and wrestling. I say that because you've got guys like, you know, Frank Mir now has dipped his toes into pro wrestling. You've got, uh, King Mo has done both. You've got Jake Hager is fighting for Bellator and is in AEW. You know, what are your thoughts on these guys trying to go either A, from wrestling to MMA and or vice versa, wrestling to, uh, or MMA to wrestling? I'm totally fine with it. And it's actually a thing that I've thought about doing is, you know, when my MMA career is over, like how cool would it be to get in a wrestling ring with, you know, fucking Steve, you know, I mean, not literally because, you know, I know he's retired and shit, but like, that's like, it's, MMA is so taxing on your body, mostly the cutting weight. And, you know, at a point, you just can't cut weight anymore, man. If, if, if these guys can find another avenue to stay popular, stay active, stay fit, and, and make some money doing it, fuck, man, I, I encourage you so much. Like, to be, like I said, when I was a young kid, when I was eight, nine years old, the more I wanted to be a WWE superstar more than anything. And, uh, you know, then I went and then I fell in love with folk style wrestling. And then I fell in love with MMA. And, uh, you know, I'm here now. So, for, for, for me to dog guys that are trying to go the route that I originally wanted to go, no, fuck that. Like, I hope these guys, you know, pursue the, this career and, and, and have success too. But I want them to make money because, you know, MMA, it doesn't last forever. You can only take so much damage to the head 
And if these guys are able to, you know, transition to something else that's not the same, obviously, but similar and keep their popularity and make money, fuck yeah, man. I, I encourage that more than anybody. Dave Mazzani, good training partner in, in Vegas. Gina Mazzani, his sister. Um, Gina Mazzani's in the UFC. She just got re-signed to the UFC. They they do local wrestling matches, you know, it's like 20 bucks a ticket, you know, and, 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 and they have a tag team duo and they do great. And like I said, Gina is in the UFC. She, she has like four fights in the UFC. She just got re-signed for a short notice a couple weeks ago and she has a couple more to go. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's fucking great, man. It's, you know, and, and the more notoriety, the more pop, you know, the more popular someone can get, the more views you can get, whether you're looking at me for wrestling, whether you're looking at me for hunting, fishing or MMA, the better man and the more money we make and uh you know in the long run we all want to retire so i i think it's great all right so Corey, i've been running my mouth for a minute i've been seeing you ready to go what do you got i well i was just gonna go on on his point that i think you, you see a lot of fighters doing that you know with whether it be the podcasting whether you whether it be uh, like you said transitioning into wrestling i mean you see tons of people doing that now it's, i mean it's a it's a real way to uh, carry your fan base. You know, a lot of these, a lot of fans are fans for who you are, not just for the uh, performance that you put on, you know. Sure. So being able to carry that uh, through multiple venues, I guess you could say, or uh, ventures in your life. I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, uh, it's definitely obtainable. I mean, you see it a lot nowadays. No, I, I agree. And like, and like you're saying, the podcast and commentating, is that's, you know, when, when I, I have a big gust of air, you know what I mean? I got a lot to say about a lot of things and that's, and that's an avenue that I look to take on, you know, when this whole thing's over, I know I'm just, it's the beginning of my career. I feel like my career has restarted. So I, I still have a long ways to go, but eventually, you know, that's something I want to look into maybe pro wrestling, maybe commentating, maybe doing podcasts, stuff like that because the things i'm interested in i have a lot to say about it and there's a lot of people that like the things i'm interested in i know right now i'm just covered in mosquitoes i'm slapping myself <laughs> I can still have circles like it's, around you, dude. it's crazy it, it's fucking insane um but you know i gotta look at the end of my career like i can't fight in the ufc forever you know i, I got a five-year stint hopefully and that would be a successful career maybe a little longer maybe a little less who knows but you know i gotta look into past that so you know commentating podcasts hunting, fishing, YouTube channels, you know, uh, stuff like that. That's, that, that's all stuff I take into consideration. Cause like I said, I like to talk and I got a lot to talk about when I like it. it well, right. Was it the, was it the media week upcoming before your fight that Dana was Dana White was saying to the media that the UFC isn't a career, it's an opportunity. I might not have necessarily agreed with what he was saying, but that kind of lends into what we were just talking about. I mean, it's an opportunity for you to build your name, build a big enough fan base so that you can transition to something later in life. You know, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's a repeat, um, you know, uh, it's re if he repeats something that he said, but I, like I said, before, before we all went out there and fight, he took all the fighters, put them in the room and he told us all like, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to show what you got, showcase the world. What you got. There's no other sports going right now. So, he, I mean, he said, somebody tomorrow is going to make 50 grand. Let's see if it's you. Yeah. And that's all I could think about. When he, from that moment, he said that till the next day. That's all I could think about is like, this is my chance to make, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in the next 15 minutes. Like, let's, 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 uh, let's show what I can do. And, uh, I was able to get out there and, and, and get it done. And I, I got the bonus. So, that's, you know, let's, that's, it, it, like that, you said, that's, that's right. You know, said it, it said exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like I said, it's life-changing money. And, uh, you know, <laughs> here we are. Uh -oh. He froze. Enough to get you a new house, get you a new car. You yeah, know. Can, anything. Pay off my debt. Like I'm finally debt free. I'm 30 years old. And I'm finally debt free. Oh, that's after all these years. Man. Yeah, like exactly. That's that's awesome. I mean, you know, not have to worry about that monthly payment. You know, anymore coming and off the for another the uh, for a little while at least. At least till my next fight. You know, I, like I'm not saying that I'm oh fuck I'm strapped. No, for the yeah, you're not set, days, but. but but the next month, a couple months, I it takes a lot of pressure off, man. And uh, yeah, absolutely, you know, buy, buy my family, buy my son something nice, buy my mom something nice, my dad, so on and so forth. The people that have yeah. supported me through the years, I get to pay them finally because there's no money in MMA until you make it to the UFC, until you make your rise, until you make a good contract in Bellator. You know, so fortunately, I got to that point. Now I can start paying people off that helped me get here. So, yeah, and I completely understand that. I'm a single income father of two with a house payment, so. 
I, I understand they flick, you know, completely, man. When the when the opportunity like that presents itself, and then like you said, when you get a, a speech leading into it and really kind of put the thought in your head of, you know, like this is something that I can I can really progress my life forward. And not only with that one opportunity, I mean, look at what you presented with yourself, with yourself. you know, leading up. Now you, now you're in yeah and and that was the hardest part man like I said staying mentally tough and you know again back to my coaching staff back to my family back to all my supporters they're the ones that got me here man all I did was show up to the gym and train you know but the hardest part for me is getting to the gym you know it's 120 degrees out in Vegas getting to the gym where I'm gonna sweat my ass off get punched in the face I don't have a fight coming up but I still have to find a way to get up to the gym and and get punched in the face like who wants to go get fucking punched in the face you know, for fun. And, you know, with nothing coming up, when I have a fight coming up, that's one thing, but to do it with nothing coming up uh, is a total another. And that, and that's the, that's what it's been for the last year. So I mean, I'm trying to get a light on here. So you're all good. You're all good. We can still hear you. Yeah. The audio, the audio is still coming through good. So. so now that you're, you know, so now that you've gotten into the UFC, like you said, you, said, you know, you know of that uh, list, uh, list. What's next for you? Are you, you know, I mean, like, are you ready for whoever's next or do you have anybody you're looking at or, you know, is it just kind of first come first serve? And I'll pose you the same question that I posed Jamal Hill. Um, Do you think that people's kind of hesitancy to fight with the COVID presents more opportunity for guys like you who are just getting into the U.S.? Uh, Yeah. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people are concerned about that, but guess what? You know, I'm 30 years old. I'm healthy. I don't have COVID. I don't give a fuck about that shit. I need to pay my fucking bills. I need to, you know, put food on the table for my kid. Like, you know, people I know, oh, I don't want to take this. I don't want to travel because of COVID. I don't give a fuck about that. I'm here to pay my bills. With that being said, my hit list right now, you know, I think Austin Hubbard's number one on my list right now. I think he's a great fighter. He's won two out of his last three fights in the UFC. He just beat my teammate, Max. God damn, motherfucker. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> I hold on a sec. I can get in the car now and uh, talk. Anyways, he just won the last two out of three fights. Uh, you know, for the UFC, he's a great lengthy striker. I think him and I put on fight of the night, man. I, I think that he's gonna try and pepper me with his, you know, his his reach, and I I can knock him out. So you know, don't blink. So I I'd have to say number one on my hit list is Austin Hubbard. If I had to say number two, um, Alex Caceres. He's been in the UFC. For a long, long time, he has a huge following, like yeah. five years back and forth on Twitter. Um, and he told me, he said, hey, when you get to the UFC, let me know. Well, guess what, motherfucker? I'm here now, and I'm here to stay, too. I ain't no, I ain't, I'm no bitch, man. So Alex Caceres, uh, uh, my featherweight debut would be fantastic. And then uh, third and last of all is Jakar Klaus. Uh, me and Jakar, uh, both from Michigan. Um I was 58-0 in my senior year in high school. He was 55-0, and uh, I lost to him in the wrestling state championship by uh, one stalling point. So uh, I think he's a great guy. I think he's a great fighter. It's no harsh feelings. Uh, I just like to punch him in the face for beating me in 2007. <laughs> just got to get that one back. Yeah, exactly. So it's not, it's not a hostile thing, but I'd love to punch him in the face. Hey, I like it. Come in and tell motherfuckers what's up. That's what we that's what we need to see more of here in the UFC. So before I get cut you out of here, so we got a question that we've asked to everybody from the likes of Booker T to Eric Bischoff, you know, everybody that's come on from UFC, Bellator, whatever. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of restructure it in a fight sense. So for you when you're going into fights, if we weren't in the normal we were in the circumstances we're in right now. Is there, you know, are there any pet peeves you have on fight day or like fight week for you? And are there any like pre-fight rituals? I ask because we also ask this to wrestlers. We've had everything from keep your baby mama out the locker room, wash your balls, have your own wrist tape, bring your own squirt bottle, uh, okay. you know, just all kinds of shit that you wouldn't guess. So for you, are there any pet peeves fight week, fight day that bother you or anything that's like a, a no, 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 that pisses you off? In the past, I'll tell you a couple. Uh, there's not many, but there are a couple things. Uh, this my experience for the UFC. I haven't had any because they're so straight laced. Uh, big thing is the weigh in. So when I fought for uh, the WXC like two fights ago, I fought Brandon Noble. I don't know if you know. 
And uh, I call Mike, I, I, I bring, I have my scale and I step on my scale and I'm like three pounds overweight. I call Mike and, and, and Brandon as well. And I was like, Hey, I'm three pounds over. Um, I'm going to cut weight. I'll see you guys in five hours, whatever it is. And uh, he's like, all right, cool. Uh, an hour later, two hours later, I was like, all right, I'm on weight. I want to compare my scale to the official scale. And uh, he's like, all right, sounds good. Get a hold of the other guy, blah, 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 blah. Well, I can never get the scales combined. I'm taking video. I take my scale to the event. Um, I step on my scale. I'm on weight. I step on their scale. I'm a pound and a half over. And I was so freaking mad. Like I was raging mad because now I look like a fucking asshole. So anyways, long story short, uh, the UFC has a community scale for all the fighters to check their weight. And it's exactly how much uh, the official scale is, but not uh, long story short again, um, not having the official scale is my biggest pet peeve, pet peeve because you can go buy a hundred dollar scale from Walmart. It doesn't matter. It might not match the official scale. It could be a pound heavy. It could be a pound light. It could be exact. But again, my biggest pet peeve is not being able to check on the official scale. Hey, that, that, that's a new one. That's a different one. Okay. The other question I have, and I guess I can uh, split it into two questions so I don't keep you too long. So sure. If you, right. pick, if you could pick any person, whether whoever it be, it could be an MMA guy, jiu-jitsu guy, hell, it could be even a wrestler if you want. If you could fight anybody here, let's do both since you're a wrestling fan. If you could fight anybody, whether it be from the wrestling world or MMA, anybody at all, who would it be and why? Ooh, that's a tough one. I, I mean, I'd have to go with Steve Austin, man. And you want to fight him? Shit. All right. Well, I mean, that's my idol. Like, how cool would it be? I mean, honestly, from a respect point, to stare across at the ring and a guy you've looked up to since you were seven, eight years old. I didn't even know what drinking beer really was, you know. <laughs> and he's drinking beer that all. And now I'm a fucking beer drinker. And you know, like, it's not that I want to fight him and punch him in the face. Uh, or hurt him or him hurt me or anything, but just to share that experience to look across the cage or the ring of somebody that you've idolized. Like, like I said, Steve Austin, Chuck Norris are probably the only two people I could ever meet and be like starstruck. You know, I've met a lot of famous people before and it's not a big deal to me. Like, but Steve Austin molded my childhood, he molded everything up until I was, you know, 15 years old. Like, I, don't, I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine looking across and having that experience of, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, I, I know there's a lot of guys out there that could be sh uh, starstruck or had idols growing up, but Steve Austin is my number one idol. I think he's the greatest wrestler of all time. And like I said, man, it's, again, it's not about the fight. It's about looking across the ring at your idol and being like, holy fuck. You know what I mean? Like, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that'd be dope. That'd be dope. So, I think that's a lot of what fuck. fighting I think that's a lot of what fighting's about, you know, is a respect thing, you know. It doesn't it, always have to be a, you know, a you know, I uh, I I put out for Broken Skull Rant, so Steve Austin had a show on CMT called that's Broken Skull Rant. Dumb. Dude, I made it through my application process, and I made it to the interview, and allegedly I had a great interview, and uh, I, I finished like the top twenty-five, and they only took fifteen, and. Uh, I was really heartbroken about that. I had an awesome intro video as WWE style video <laughs> that I, that I did like, just, I don't know. I'll send it to you. It's on YouTube. I, th or I don't know if it's, if it's public, but I don't know. It was really cool. I think if I send it to you, you'd appreciate it for sure. Hey man, it, <laughs> he's definitely for me, he's a white whale for me to get to interview at some point. Like DDP was a really cool one, dude. Like you oh. know, he was one I was watching from the time I was a kid. Right. And so, sure. It was insane. We were we were working. Uh, have you have you seen that company AEW at all? The you know the new one. That's yeah, yeah, wrestling company. Yeah. Yeah. So we went to go work uh, Starcast three in Chicago, and our buddies from Breaking Down the Ring. Which, if you guys watch wrestling or have been to any of our parties downtown, you already know who Breaking Down the Ring is. Sure. Anyways, um, so they had a a booth, and I was the only one from our show to go down there. So I'm like, all right, well, the hell with it. They sit him down literally the next table to the right of us. He looks at me, looks at all my buddies' signs, looks up, looks down, looks up, looks down. So, uh, you guys are a podcast. So, uh, you going to interview me, bro? No way. Really? 
I'm like, well, bet. I said, I ain't got no prep, but I had just read his book, which if you haven't read that shit, positively unstoppable. It's great for mindset shit. But uh, yeah, man, he just, he was like, yo, like, let's go with it. And I got like a good 10, 12 minute interview, which if you're subscribing to us on YouTube, which you should be, that's there on the uh, page as well. Like I said, he was a cool one for me as well. Last question before I let you get out of here. Send it. If you, um, you know, everybody always kind of dreams of that, um, that first walk to the octagon, that kind of thing. Um, did you like, was there ever like a set song that you ever wanted to walk out to? If you could pick any song, like either have somebody make it for you or, you know, just a song that's already out, you know, what are your thoughts on that first walk out to the cage? And did you think about that at all? Oh yeah, definitely. So you know, uh, as you know, obviously I'm from Michigan, you know, I live in Las Vegas now. Uh, but you know, going back to the people back home, man, like people back in Michigan that have supported me through these years, the guys that girl, guys and girls I went to high school with guys, and girls I went to college with that have supported me. So the most appropriate song, um, you know, it's been my last couple, uh, walkout songs. Uh, when I fought Troy Lampson for the TWC, uh, I think when I fought Warfield, I think someone did a remix of it. It's called people back home by For- Florida, Georgia line. And it's a country song. If you don't like country music, go fuck yourself. But uh, uh, <laughs> very emotional song for me um, because it hits really, it hits pretty hard. And it just kind of describes, you know, all my supporters through the years, you know, and, and basically saying, hey, whether I win or lose, this is for you guys. This is for all the people back home. So whether you like country music or not, people back home by Florida Georgia Line is my favorite walkout song. I've, like I said, I've walked out, out to it four or five times now. And, uh, It'll probably be my next walkout too, because like I said, I'm only here because the people of Michigan, my mom, my dad, uh, my friends and family that have supported me that the times when I'm like, Hey, look, I'm done with this. Like, Hey, stop being a little bitch. And, you know, just finish out what you're doing. You know, it wasn't for my people back home. You know, I, we wouldn't be talking right now. And uh, so every time I'm walking off the cage, I like to listen to this song and have a, like a, like a friendly reminder. Hey, look, motherfucker, you bite down in your mouthpiece because you're doing this for all your people back home. So no pun intended. I mean, hey, dude, you can't not respect that. I've seen them in concert before. Definitely a fun concert to go to. Um, I just want to say, dude, thanks for coming on. Thanks for uh, spending your time with us. I mean, obviously, like I said at the beginning of the show, uh, I've known you since I was, what, 16 years old, man. And, uh, you know, it's been it's been quite a long time. Uh, Devin, you missed out. You didn't get your chance to uh, pick Justin's brain of anything he remembered about me because he's got this thing he likes to try to embarrass me every time. Uh, every time I bring somebody on that's trained with me, like Miles, dude, he let Miles have a fucking field day. Uh... <laughs> so, dude, it's cool to see where you're at, man. Like I said, I've been watching you for years. I trained with you in the past. Like I said, man, it's cool to see where you're at, man, and uh, can't wait to see what you're gonna do next in the UFC, bro. Hey man, I really appreciate you guys having me. It's a blast. Anytime you guys want to, ch- oh shit, my light went off. Anytime you guys want to chit chat, let me know. Uh, fuck, I, I think you guys lost the light for the rest of the. It's you know, it's all the good, bro. Here, but but uh, we'll definitely have you come back, man. Throw your social media out. Let everybody know where they can find you, and we'll get out of here. I'm at uh, Instagram J A Y zero nine M I. Uh, Twitter is Justin Jane's MMA, and then Facebook is just Justin Jane's. Well, man, we'll have to link up and get that beer before you get out of here. Maybe I'll drag. Hey, I'm here for I'm here for uh, till July 12th. So anytime you want to get together, fuck, let's let's hey, do some cold ones. I'm I, hey, I'm free tomorrow night and Thursday, man. So get with me. Tomorrow sounds good, bro. I'll talk to you soon. All right, brother. Hey, brother, appreciate right, it, man. Man. Hey, appreciate you guys. Have fun. All right, have a good night. Likewise, yeah, you too, man. Good luck right, on man. the uh, UFC. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, not a problem, brother. You too. All right, well, there you have it, man. Justin James, fresh off of his knockout UFC. Uh, Corey, what would you think? This is your first full show with us. You've been with us on the prediction videos, which make sure you're checking those out because we're going to have one for the UFC Fight Island. Corey will be back with me for that as well. Uh, what would you think of your first Stealing full show, belt. man? Stealing the belt. But I thought it went well, man. I thought he had some great topics to talk about. I thought he had some really great stories, and I thought it was good to, you know, hear – hear his backstory on how he uh, made his way here and not only that but you know how he how he didn't feel the nerves I mean how do you not feel the nerves for your first UFC fight he was saying he was was saying he was in the back not even feeling it 
Well, dude, I mean, you got to think about it, though. I mean, like he said, he's all fought, that experience. Experience. Plus, he's all fought that experience. a series of fighting, Bellator, yeah. all that stuff. I mean, dude, he's got all the experience. So, like I said, man, I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. We're going to have more guys from the UFC coming soon. Um, the show, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be taking a break for a couple weeks on the regular Tuesday show. I've got some things to take care of, but there's still going to be prediction videos, reaction videos for the UFCs coming up. We'll have Corey with us. Fez will be with us. Uh, the boys will be back soon as well. Like I said, hopefully all of you guys are safe with the pandemic and everything that's going on with that as well. Um, you know, like I said, it's a crazy time for all of us. We're figuring out here at knockouts and three counts as well. But like I said, the content won't stop. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got more guys from the UFC coming up soon. Make sure you check out Justin James. All his social media will be in the description of this video. And until next time, make sure you follow me at Detroit Knockout, Detroit N-O-K-O-U-T. Make sure you're following the show at KO3C Pod uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Knockouts and three counts on YouTube. Smash that subscribe button. And hey, shout out to our homies at Stransky and Company Realty. They've sponsored us for quite a long time now if you're in the market for a house especially now that you can go check them out in person hit them up 248-563-9449 admin at stranskyandcompany.com they're your guys for a new home Corey, anything else before we get the fuck out of here no nope. thanks for having me on you guys will be seeing more of my big dumb mug on this F on this uh here show coming up so hey man we're looking forward to it justin thank you for your time until next time peace